Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us during our summer webinar series for um, shellfish aquaculture. And today we're excited to have one of our project partners, Reed Porter, presenting on his research related to some of the operational limitation that shellfish farmers may encounter. Before we jumped into that, um, I wanted to give a brief overview of the project to provide some context. So I'm Stephanie Otts. I'm the director of the National Sea Grant Law Center. This webinar is actually the final stages of a project that was funded back in 2017 by the NOAA National Sea Grant Office um, that was a partnership between a number of Sea Grant legal programs throughout the country to look at particular legal impediments, challenges, or barriers to shellfish aquaculture around the country. The project team involves a variety of, of partners from Sea Grant programs in Rhode Island, Georgia, Virginia, and California. And the overall objectives of the project were to, um, like I mentioned, investigate these uh, impediments or barriers. The project resulted in the development of eight case studies that are available on our project website, which you can reach by going to the National Sea Grant Law Center's homepage and clicking on projects or following the link below. And we are recording the webinar and we'll make it available on our website later today or tomorrow morning and you would also be able to access the slides that way. So with that introduction, I'm going to turn it over to our presenter today, Reed Porter, to um, talk about his case studies and the research that they've been doing. All right. Okay. Um, I think everyone should be able to hear me and now see my screen. So um, thanks um, again for joining us. Um, I am Reed Porter. I'm the senior staff attorney here at the Marine Affairs Institute and the Rhode Island Sea Grant Legal Program. Um, we're based at the Roger Williams University School of Law in beautiful Bristol, Rhode Island. Um, and um, I'm going to be talking about some work that we did on this project, looking at um, an element of siting of shellfish aquaculture facilities that doesn't get as much attention as uh, siting of grow areas. And that's some of the operational considerations um, that, that go into siting these facilities. Before I get into that, um, two quick slides about us. Um, we are uh, the only Sea Grant legal program in the Northeast, and um, we try to support informed decision making. Um, so obviously, like any Sea Grant uh, program, we are non-advocacy and we don't do any litigation. Um, so we're trying to provide good nonpartisan information to our stakeholder community. Um, I run what's called the Rhode Island Sea Grant Law Fellow Program. And um, it's an experiential education program where current law students do um, work on ocean and coastal law and policy topics um, for, uh, for stakeholders. And um, in fact, uh, this work that I'm going to talk about um, was largely conducted um, by three of my students. Um, uh, Mitchell Ramick uh, did the, the work on uh, boat ramps, um, and Joseph Bingaman and Jordan Viana um, did work on nursery uh, upweller siting. Um, so I want to make sure that they get credit for, for their hard work on this. Um, some of you may have seen Jordan actually presented um, on some of this work at um, NACE in January um, and did a great job. So. Um, by presenting here, um, they're all out uh, for the summer having their vacation and I'm, I'm stuck here with you. Um, and uh, any questions, um, you can always ask me about it um, as some of them have actually graduated. Okay, so let's get down to brass tacks. Um, most of the legal research on shellfish aquaculture siting to date has really focused on um, initial permitting decisions around um, grow out sites. Um, and that's 
for good reason. It's in a lot of places quite hard to get those those permits for for or leases for for grow out. Um, but that's only one piece of um, any aquaculture business. Um, you have to also consider a, a variety of um, related uh, infrastructural and operational needs um, that are that are required to run a successful shellfish business. Um, and in that sense, shellfish aquaculture is really part of the working waterfront economy. Um, and it faces a lot of the same challenges that other, other aspects of the working waterfront community are facing. Limited um, access to industrial or commercial waterfront sites for um, doing commercial work rather than um, residential boating or um, recreational boating, excuse me, or similar things of that nature. And so those are the sorts of um, questions that um, we get a lot of in Rhode Island, um, where our, um, our working waterfront sites are, are restricted, um, but we're seeing a lot of growth in our, in our aquaculture. Um, growers need, um, in order to be successful, they need daily uh, year-round vessel and raft access to get, get out to those grow out areas where their, where their products are. They need a place to land product. Um, as well as to load and offload gear. Um, they need a place to store the gear, um, especially in the winter when it may be um, a, a, a risk due to ice um, or um, when, when your gear is needing to dry out, um, wet storage may be infeasible. Um, so, and, and those gear storage areas may, may cause some aesthetic um, complaints from neighbors. And then you also need a, a place where you can you can get your seed up to a size that's appropriate for placing out and grow out. And um, in, our, in our region, a lot of folks like to use upwellers um, due to the, the speed and, and effectiveness of that, that, that type of a, a nursery facility. Um, so you need to have a place where you can, you can install your upweller system. Where can you do that? Um, our Coastal Resources Management Council, which is our coastal zone agency here in Rhode Island, um, has noted actually in its, um, in its regulations that our working waterfront sites are limited and declining. Um, so this is actually a quote from our, um, what we call our red book. Um, and it notes, we don't have new areas that we can put in new marinas. Um, and the places that we do have, uh, marinas have to be protected or we're going to to be losing the ability to have um, have sites um, for 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 activities like this um, we've seen a lot of our urban areas um, such as Newport um, the amount of working waterfront sites that are available to our industries have have become more limited and that's a, a, a challenge that I think is faced not only by the aquaculture community um, but by fishermen and other um, aspects of, of the working waterfront community. To give those of you who are not um, local to or experienced with Rhode Island a sense of what um, our local context is, um, we have a fairly small but substantially growing shellfish aquaculture community here in Rhode Island. Um, most of this is focused on oyster aquaculture as, as is common in the Northeast, although there are a number of other species also under culture. Um, a lot of these sites are um, coastal subtidal plots. Most of them are quite small in scale, um, under 10 acres. Um, and that means that they're uh, more intensive. There are some bottom planting um, lease sites out there, but many of them are rack and bag systems um, where you're, you're producing uh, uh, commercial scale of, of uh, product on uh, for the half shell market on a small small acreage. Um, in some areas, our acreage is actu actually limited. Um, the salt ponds, and you can see um, one of the salt ponds is um, circled on the map. Um, no more than five percent of those ponds can be placed in aquaculture um, lease, and that each of those ponds is is really approaching that 5% limit. So there are some siting constraints um, in our regulations. Um, in other areas, for example, Narragansett Bay to the right, um, that limitation does not apply. So there are continuing sites available um, and continuing interest in the growth of this industry. As the industry continues to grow, however, each of those um, 
those businesses needs to be able to find the wa working waterfront infrastructure that it needs um, in order to be successful. So we have an increased demand um, for working waterfront infrastructure, but a static or decreasing supply. Um, and that sets up uh, an opportunity for some challenges, obviously, to occur. Um, number one is, for a number of reasons that I'll go into, it's important to have your, your land side infrastructure in the same geographic location as your lease site. Um, and that can be a challenge in a place like a salt pond um, where there's a limited amount of, of opportunities for that. Um, a lot of our marinas may be changing in ownership or some have con converted to a, a documinium structure. And those owners may be unwilling to allow continued use or new use um, by growers. Um, they, might, they might prefer to keep things for recreational users and that may constrain the supply. And then in some places, although um, generally not in Rhode Island, private residential docks um, may or may not be able to be used for commercial um, purposes. So uh, the, the availability of um, that waterfront infrastructure um, does present a number of challenges. And we've seen that, that happen in the real world um, where there have been issues. Um, we had a grower collective that actually had to purchase a marina or chose to purchase a marina um, to ensure that they would continue to have slips available, a place to store their, their gear um, in perpetuity rather than being sort of um, subject to the, the whims of, of the, the current marina owner. Um, we've had legal disputes about um, whether new upwellers could be placed in a documinium situation. Um, and that, that actually posed a risk to an existing upweller system that was in that, in that documinium as well. Um, and then there's been concern in the area for folks that are relying on public boat ramps um, to get their vessels in the water load and offload gear and product um, that state agencies may, may restrict um, access for commercial use to those boat launch uh, locations. Um, and that, that can be a problem in Connecticut. Actually, somebody did receive, I, I believe, a ticket um, for unlawful use of, of uh, state boat launch. Um, so that's, that's another uh, potential avenue where, where people could rely on those public boat ramps, but that can, that can raise legal problems as well. So today I'm going to talk about two case studies um, that we did. Number one is, uh, this, this first one is on nursery siting, or, or um, really upweller siting, but nurseries more broadly. Um, and I'm going to look at Ninigret Pond um, as a good case study for that uh, to, to explain some of the, the, the pros and cons and, and legal challenges around um, nursery upweller siting. The second one is on that boat ramp situation, and I'm going to look a little bit more um, nationwide on that in terms of um, how different states approach uh, commercial and aquaculture use of, of uh, state-owned boat ramps. So nursery siting. Um, our farms here in Ninigrit Pond, this is the, the area that was circled on the map uh, a few slides ago, um, our farms are generally located on the overwash behind an undeveloped barrier beach. This is a picture uh, of one of them. Um, it's a mixture of bottom plant and rack and bag culture. Um, the salt ponds are an area that's heavily used for recreation and is very beloved to um, folks in the local community um, for a variety of uses. Um, it's sort of our, our swimming pool, I guess, in the summertime for the South County um, communities. And so a lot of the decisions around aquaculture in these areas can be uh, a little bit fraught um, from a sort of community perspective. As, uh, be that as it may, um, these growers need to have um, nurseries and they have a couple of different uh, nursery facilities that they can choose from. Um, you could do a rack and bag system at your grow out site potentially. Um, there probably would be if it was possible some floating upweller systems or flupsies or tailor floats placed at the grow out site. Um, the, the picture in the center there is, um, is a floating upweller system. Um, you could do a floating upweller at a remote location, such as a marina, or you could have a land-based facility, and that's shown sort of at the right. Um, 
where you've, you've got an upweller um, on land uh, using water that's piped in. Um, the Flupsy is preferred by many growers for, for a variety of reasons. So we were thinking about how can that be done? How does the law limit where and how you can do, do that particular kind of system? Um, before we get into to, to the details of that, you should know that in Rhode Island, we have basically three administrative or um, governmental entities that are uh, mostly governing um, where and how aquaculture can happen. The Coastal Resources Management Council, CRMC is our coastal zone agencies, um, and they regulate use of submerged lands and coastal land areas, including those aquaculture leases. The Department of Environmental Management, or DEM, um, regulates the, sort of the cultured organisms and the water quality. And then we have local governments. Um, local governments in Rhode Island do not have authority beyond um, um, in submerged lands beyond the high tide line, um, but they do have, obviously, authority over land use on land through their planning and zoning authority. So thinking about CRMC first, um, you do need a assent um, from CRMC and Elise in order to um, set up your grow out location as well as your, your nursery site. In order to get that approval, that's a category B activity is how we describe it. And basically that requires, um, in most cases, a public hearing and that's in this area often a, a contested public hearing. Your activity also has to be consistent with the, the water type classification of that water um, where, you, where you're looking to, to put it. And in this map here, you can see that Ninigrit Pond is a combination of conservation areas and those um, sort of border a national wildlife refuge and um, low intensity uses. So this is intended to be a, an area where there's not a lot of industrial development. Um, there are two existing marinas and they're circled here in black. Um, those would not be allowed now. Um, if they were new uh, because of, of the water type, but they are allowed now. Um, in practice, um, obviously those applications uh, for aquaculture grow out sites have been approved, um, but they do, the assents for those from the, from the council have um, included some important stipulations. Um, and among those is um, this one here, this is, um, cut and pasted from the actual stipulations on, on that ascent. Um, and it says vessels, barges, or floating docks shall not be anchored or moored at the lease site unless the permittee is actively engaged in operations there. So um, that means you can't leave your upwelling system at your grow out site if you're not there act actively working on it. Um, so that basically prohibits you from doing a floating system at your lease site. Um, now th this is on a specific, um, grow out location and it's possible that in other locations where there's less community um, concern or where it's a different type of water that they might allow uh, those floating docks or uh, barges um, to be to be moored or anchored um, although i have my my doubts about how how likely that would be um, this does mean that you could do a rack and bag system uh, there's no stipulations that you you have to use um, organisms over a certain size. So you, you could do a rack and bag system, but as I said before, for, for a variety of reasons, that's, that's less um, beneficial for the community or for the industry. Um, so um, basically that means that if you wanna have an upweller, you need to do it at a remote location. Um, happily for growers, um, CRMC regulations streamline permitting for those remote uh, upweller locations. Uh, we have a specific section in our regs that um, makes it easy to do a category A ascent um, for those remote sites. You do need to go through a separate um, ascent process, um, but generally there's no, there's no hearing required, um, and you can go ahead and um, get a, an ascent for a, an upweller located at a marina, residential dock, or pier. Um, and this is, on this map, you can see that there are, um, a sense for that. Um, the, the one that circled, you can see on Google Maps, does appear to be a, um, a FLEPSI. And um, this is beneficial for, for a couple of reasons. For example, you can sometimes get access to shoreside power or water if you need it. Um, it's quite easy to get to these um, facilities um, when you want to check on your stock. So um, that's all well and good. Um, one limitation is you want your marina 
definitely to be in the same um, biosecurity zone as your grow out location. Um, if, if an integrate grower was to put uh, a uh, nursery upweller in Judith Pond, they would need to get a pathology test every time they wanted to move um, stock to the grow out and that costs money and costs time. So there's a really strong incentive to make sure that your remote location is in your, your same location. In other areas, for example, most of Narragansett Bay is the same biosecurity zone, that wouldn't be as much of a problem. Oops. Okay, so we've sort of dealt with CRMC, but what about DEM? And as I noticed, D, as I uh, noted earlier, DEM is our water quality regulator in the state of Rhode Island. Um, and um, they classify waters as approved, restricted, or, or otherwise for uh, shellfish. Um, the western area of Ninigrit Pond, um, which is where all the aquaculture is, obviously, is approved for, for shellfish. The eastern area of the pond gets a lot less um, flow and is prohibited. So um, we wouldn't see any upwellers or, frankly, grow out locations in that area until that changes, or unless that changes. The problem comes up when you think about seasonal closures of marina areas uh, for shellfishing. Um, and those are the very same areas where those outwellers are supposed to be. Um, what, what is a grower to do in that situation? Well, happily, um, it is possible to get um, an exception for um, growing of seed in marinas and restricted waters. Um, you have to have an, a CRMC assent for that and an operational plan. Um, with those, you can cultivate seed up to an inch and a quarter in those restricted uh, waters, followed by depuration in an approved grow out location. And so that allows nurseries in those marina seasonal closed areas. Um, this does not apply to land based facilities. And I'm not going to go into that, um, but those do need an additional pollutant discharge permitting because you're, you're um, pumping water um, out of a pipe that, that's gonna require an additional permit. Um, and that can be a lot more challenging. So in this, in this sense, uh, this, this DEM exception um, really allows remote FLUPSI development um, in areas that are um, acceptable um, for, for creation of, of seed and, and operating a nursery upweller. Now, what about local ordinances? Um, I mentioned before, I think that local authority ends at the water's edge, um, but in some cases, those nursery facilities may have some sort of nexus to the land that makes the local government's land use and zoning restrictions apply to them. Um, if that happens, that land-based facility or whatever that facility is that, that's subject to local land use has to be located in a zone that allows aquaculture. Um, a public hearing is often needed. And as I noted before, and many of you already know, those public hearings can be extremely contested, especially at the local level. Um, in some cases, you might need a special permit as well. So how would this play out? Um, here's Ninigrit Pond again, um, and you can see that this this land use or this zoning map that that's showing is, is pretty complicated but the marinas are the red in the red and gray striped areas um and i'll point to them here with my mouse right here and up here um and in other locations there's there's not all the other locations bordering this pond are either yellow which is residential green which is open space um, or there's a little bit of blue here that actually doesn't touch the pond, um, but that would be municipal use. So if you're going to locate a, um, a facility in one of those areas, you'd have to figure out um, whether aquaculture is allowed there. Um, now that, that raises the question of what is, what is aquaculture? Is it agricultural use? Is it hatchery use? Is it commercial use? Or is it none of those? Um, each town has its own uses um, and its own zone definitions. So this is not something that you could apply elsewhere. Um, but in this particular town, these are the uses that are in their, their zoning regulations. Um, and you can see that depending on how that aquaculture facility is, is 
is um, categorized. Um, it could be prohibited if it was a commercial use in a residential zone um, versus allowed. Um, or there could be a special use permit requirement if it was a hatchery in a residential zone. If the building inspector in the town decides that it's none of the, the use categories, um, then that building inspector would determine on their own whether or not um, it should be allowed or not. And you, you probably have to get a special permit for that as well. So I'm sure that many of the folks here who, um, who are on the call who may have had experience working with local zoning, um, this could be a, a fairly challenging um, process to have to go through um, and one that, that, that involves a fair amount of uncertainty. So I think we'd expect that most folks would want to avoid that. Um, and there are, there are probably some ways that you could do that. Um, in particular, um, thinking about ways to avoid that nexus with land might be useful. So solar power, for example, uh, means you wouldn't have any um, need to connect to land, land, land power, and that would definitely avoid um, that, that particular issue. Um, in summary, um, we can see that it would be difficult to get your ascent for floating gear at your grow out location. So you couldn't do a flopsy there, you're limited to rack and bag, which means you have to get a second um, permit approval for a remote uh, flopsy if you wanted to do that, which does have a streamlined CRMC ascent process and um, is allowed even in restricted areas as long as you have a deprivation um, process in, in, in place, um, but it may also raise some questions with some of that local land use. If you're doing a land-based system, there's a couple of additional challenges that you have to meet, and that includes water pollutant discharge permitting under the Clean Water Act, as well as local zoning approval. Um, and obviously, um, most people that are in this situation would look at that remote um, marina-based flopsy and say that that's the solution for me. So that's case study one. Case study two, um, access to public boat launches. This is going to be a little bit shorter, but you, we've seen this before. Um, there's a lot more boats, there's limited um, berthing opportunities, and our, and our state regulations say there's a, a heavy demand on launching ramps, they're in short supply, poor condition of limited parking capacity. Um, that can create a situation where there's not enough of the resource to go around and growers might end up on the short end of the stick, right? Now, some growers might use the launches to, launch, to, to access lease sites, to launch their vessels or their rafts, um, to load or un, unload gear and, and land product for sale. Um, there have been reports in Rhode Island that that state personnel have suggested prohibiting growers. That has not happened um, to my knowledge to date, um, but it could be something that comes up again in the future. And ideally, um, we'd wanna make sure that that, that resource is, is maintained for everybody if we can avoid those conflicts. One reason that um, that conflict might arise is that um, most state boat ramps are actually constructed with mostly federal money. And that money is provided by the Dingle Johnson Federal Aid and Sport Fish Restoration Act. You might also know this as Wallet Bro, which was an amendment to that to the Dingle Johnson Act. Um, and that provides a 75% federal cost share for developing, among other things, recreational boating facilities like boat ramps. Now, the trick to this is that the funding that the federal government is giving out comes directly from taxes and fees paid by recreational anglers um, in terms of boat gas, um, excise taxes, and things like that. Um, so along with that federal funding comes some, some conditions. Uh, specifically, those facilities must be used for the purpose authorized in the grant which is to say recreational boating and fishing. Um, that said, a state agency may allow commercial, recreational, and other secondary uses of a grant-funded parcel if they do not interfere with the authorized purpose of the grant. Um, basically, a state can allow a commercial use of a boat ramp as long as it's not interfering with recreational boating or fishing. Um, the states are the ones who determine whether, whether or not that could be allowed. Um, so what we did was we went out and looked at all the um, 23 coastal states and um, not all 
we looked at 23 coastal states um, and we looked at what they have said in terms of whether they allow or, or don't allow or allow with conditions um, commercial uses. And we looked at commercial activity because none of them says anything about aquaculture in this context. Um, and none of them explicitly authorizes commercial activity as a default, right? So um, if they say something, it's either um, to prohibit it or to limit it with, with conditions. And here's a, a little map about what we found. The, the three models that we found were silence, where there's no explicit statement about whether commercial activity is, is allowed. A prohibition, oftentimes with an, an exception of some kind. So commercial activity is prohibited with an exception. And you can see that's less common. Um, and then some states, a few states, authorize commercial activity under certain conditions or for per particular uses. And I'll go through a couple of models for this. Prohibition examples, um, and I'll skip silence because there's nothing to share, right? It's silent. Um, but prohibitions are, um, here's two examples of this. Um, I mentioned the Connecticut example um, earlier where somebody was cited for um, violating this rule. No person shall engage in any commercial activity at a boating access area unless so authorized by the Department of, of Environmental Protection. Um, they've issued one authorization in that state um, for Department of Transportation bridge repair staging, um, which I suspect is a larger imposition on recreational boating than um, shellfish growers, but um, that was a state use of that state facility. So you can see why they, they decided to do that. Um, in other places, you also, um, this Alabama one, um, you need that specific written authorization um, for um, commercial loading or unloading um, that may or may not be easy to get. Um, and in most cases, um, what we heard was that it's not super easy to get those sorts of written authorizations. Um, the five states with a permit or fee system um, make it a little bit more structured or, or easier to get those um, special permits to allow um, commercial activity under certain conditions. Um, sometimes these are for particular activities. Um, for example, Hawaii, um, its uh, permit system focuses on sort of catamarans for vessels, um, vessels with passengers for hire, taking people out on sunset cruises and whatnot. Um, in other places, it may be um, special rules for fishermen. So here's a couple of specific examples of that. Um, commissioner may grant a special use permit um, as long as there will be no adverse impact, right? That's hearkening back to um, that federal rule. Um, the um, Virginia one talks about how commercial fishermen are not required to pay a special spe uh, specific fee, but do have to pay to use the, the boat launches in state parks. Um, so there are ways where these states are trying to generate some income for um, commercial use of those um, state facilities um, and to make sure that they are consistent with that um, recreational use. So if we consider these three options overall, um, what are the benefits or the drawbacks of each of them? Um, with silence, it's sort of a, um, a, a zone of uncertainty where growers can use, use these facilities currently in most places. Um, they don't have to pay for it, they don't have to get a permit, but their continued access is a little bit contingent on, and uncertain, um, and that status could change. Um, on the other hand, prohibition is certainly um, a potential limitation on growth of the industry in places where um, working waterfront facilities are strongly limited. Um, there may be some opportunities to find another um, place to, to, to engage in your, your loading or unloading of gear or your, um, your product, but um, it may not be super easy to do that. Um, and a prohibition would probably apply to other activities as well. So um, there's another area here where there's common ground between fishermen, whether they're charter or commercial fishermen, also using those ramps. We have some cohoggers that, that use those ramps. And then finally, there's some advantages to thinking about um, permit or fee systems 
um, in that they provide a really clear authority for, uh, for a grower to, to use the facility while also providing the state with some um, financial support to pay for ongoing maintenance of those boat ramps. Um, we've seen before that our, our state agency notes that the condition of some of these places is poor um, in terms of potholes or um, erosion that's going on. So there is a need to, to, to fund ongoing uh, maintenance and that can be a benefit to both states and to, to potentially to growers, um, but there aren't really any models that are appropriate to aquaculture that we can, we can point to. So that brings me to the end of the two case studies that I wanted to talk about today. Um, I, I'm hopeful that by talking about these, um, that was sort of a, a little field trip through how some of the working waterfront operational limitations um, that we're seeing play out in Rhode Island um, and that, that may affect um, the shellfish aquaculture industry um, in the future. Um, I think Noah and, and other folks are, are really excited to see this industry doing well um, in Rhode Island and elsewhere. And um, we're gonna have to deal with these growing pains um, the, the more that the, the industry continues to, to expand. Um, and my hope is that by thinking about these, um, these issues, whether the ones I talked about or other operational issues in the future, um, if we think about them in advance, that we can avoid some of the um, reactionary kinds of um, problems that you might see if, if, if we don't think about them until the, the problem is, is really uh, important and uh, becomes political. So with that, um, Stephanie, maybe I'll turn it back to you. Oh, and uh, if anybody wants any information from me, my, my contact information is here um, and feel free to reach out. Thank you so much, Reed. It's so interesting to, to hear all of these um, things together as we've been going through the webinar series. And um, if you have questions, please um, use the chat box um, and we can try to answer them. Um, and here, or as Reed mentioned, you can reach out to Reed directly at the contact information on the slide. And, um, you can get your question addressed that way as well. So we'll just give folks a minute or two to see if there's any questions that are coming through the chat. And um, while that's happening, wanted to uh, give an advertisement for the, the remaining two webinars in the series that are happening in the next two weeks at the same time each Wednesday. So next week on the 21st, We'll be featuring our case study out of California that looked at certification of shellfish growing waters in federal waters. And then um, our last series, um, our last webinar at the end of the month will be about Virginia and um, their joint permitting program in Virginia. And then also um, a case study from one of the communities um, where they were able to resolve some of their land use conflicts. Well, great. Well, it looks, Reed, I don't see any questions coming in, so I want to, to thank you again for presenting today, and, and thanks everyone for being here with us. And if you have colleagues that were not able to join us today, um, the recording will be available shortly um, for viewing and at the future. So, thanks, everyone. Thanks. Please don't hesitate to reach out. <laughs>